Good morning. I'm Mark Hammond, South Carolina Secretary of State. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to our first ever live raffle webinar. We understand that raffles are an important tool to raise money for many nonprofits. We want to inform those conducting raffles of the new laws passed since raffles became legal in 2015. These new laws have increased the amount an individual raffle ticket can be sold for, increased the prize amount for exempt raffles, changed the total prize amount for non-exempt raffles, and decreased report, uh, reporting requirements with the Secretary of State's office. We hope this webinar will be beneficial to the nonprofit community. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to our general counsel, Shannon Wiley, who will be followed by Kim Wickersham, Director of Public Charities. Thank you. All right, um, thank you everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today to learn more about nonprofit raffles. As Secretary Hammond mentioned, um, they were legalized in South Carolina in 2015, and that was following um, the approval of a constitutional amendment by the voters in 2014. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to enter them into the chat feature in the Microsoft Teams application, and we will answer as many questions as we can as time permits at the end of the presentation. You can also email your questions directly to charities at sos.sc.gov and put raffles webinar in the subject line and we will respond to your email. At this time, we will start going over the legal requirements for raffles in South Carolina. Okay, so the first question we need to answer is what exactly is a raffle? And this is specifically defined in statute. South Carolina law defines raffle as a game of chance in which a participant is required to pay something of value for a ticket for a chance to win a prize. And the winner is determined by a random drawing or a similar process in which all participants have the equal chance of winning. So the key there is that something of value must be exchanged for that raffle ticket, whether it's a donation or someone buys a ticket if you have a raffle in which no one has to pay anything to enter um, or everybody is just, you know, whether or not they pay or make a donation, they can still participate. That doesn't meet the raffle definition under the law. So the key is making that payment or donation in order to participate. And only certain type of non types of nonprofit organizations are able to conduct raffles in South Carolina. So it's not enough just to be a nonprofit organization. You have to meet very specific legal requirements in order to conduct raffles. And there are really three prongs to this test of whether or not you can conduct a raffle. Um, you have to look at what type of nonprofit organization it is, what's the purpose of the organization, and is the organization compliant with the South Carolina Solicitation of Charitable Funds Act? So first looking at the types of nonprofit organizations that can conduct raffles in this state. Um, the first question to ask is whether or not you are tax exempt and tax exempt under a specific code of the IRS uh, section governing exempt organizations. So in order to do raffle, you have to either be a 501c3, a c4, a c6, c7, c8, c10, c19, or a 501d organization. If you're not tax exempt under those one of those specific code sections, you have to be a class department or organization of an educational institution as defined under the Solicitation of Charitable Funds Act. So when looking at what is an educational institution, think about your tra traditional school um, that has a, a curriculum, has students, has classes um, to teach the curriculum. It's not sufficient just to have an educational purpose. So to do any kind of raffle legally in the state of South Carolina, you either have to be tax exempt under one of those specific code sections or you have to be associated with an educational institution. 
The next test to see whether or not you can conduct, can conduct raffles is you have to look at the purpose of the organization. And under statute, um, the purpose has to be one of the following, has to be religious, charitable, scientific, literary, educational, um, for the purpose of fostering national or international amateur sports competitions or for the prevention of cruelty to children or animals. If you don't have one of these purposes, you cannot legally conduct raffles within the state. Finally, you have to be compliant with the Solicitation of Charitable Funds Act. So for more, most organizations, that's gonna mean that you have registered as a charitable organization with the Division of Public Charities of the Secretary of State's office, or you filed an application for registration exemption and you have it currently on file with our office. And that means that in order to do raffles, you, you have to have that registration on file. In addition to any raffle registration, you might be required to file. One thing to keep in mind is that churches, synagogues, mosques, and other houses of worship are not under the definition of charitable organization under the Solicitation of Charitable Funds Act. So they are excluded from that definition. What that means when it comes to raffles is that a church or other house of worship does not have to register as a charity, but can still conduct raffles if it meets the other requirements. So that means that if you're a house of worship or a church, you don't have to file a charity registration just to conduct raffles. You might still have to file a raffle registration in order to conduct raffles. But that's where the term compliant comes in when it comes to the solicitation of charitable funds that you have to comply with the act. So a church that is not registered under the solicitation of charitable funds act is still compliant and therefore can do raffles. You have to meet all three of these criteria in order to conduct raffles in the state. It's not a matter of meeting one of them or two of them. You have to do all three in order to legally hold a raffle in the state of South Carolina. So who can hold a raffle? Well, you have to be a nonprofit organization that is eligible to conduct raffles. Professional fundraisers are specifically barred from conducting raffles within the state under the laws governing nonprofit raffles. You cannot contract with another entity to do raffles on your behalf. You actually have to be the sponsor of the raffle. Um, you can partner with another nonprofit organization that can do raffles, um, but you can't you know, farm out the responsibility for conducting the raffle to a professional fundraiser or other entity that cannot legally do raffles in the state of South Carolina. So when we look at raffle registration requirements, you have to look at whether or not the organization is exempt or not exempt. And this might be confusing in the sense that, you know, we talk about tax exempt organizations and also whether or not an organization is exempt from registration under the Solicitation of Charitable Funds Act. So now we're no throwing another exempt term into the mix, and that's when it comes to raffles. Um, so whether or not a raffle is exempt or not exempt really depends on what sort of prize is offered to the um, participants in the raffle. There are some other requirements, but really we're gonna look at prize amounts when it comes to differentiating between the two types of raffles. So to have an exempt raffle, it has to meet one of two criteria. The first type of exempt raffle is one in which there's a non-cash prize that is donated to the organization or can be a group of prizes. And the total value of the prize or prizes for the single raffle event are $950 or less. So you're looking at not only a small dollar value for that prize, but it has to be non-cash prize that's donated to the organization. It can't be a cash prize or one that is a non-cash prize that's purchased by the organization it has to be donated. The second type of exempt raffle is a 50-50 raffle in which the raffle tickets are sold to members or guests of the nonprofit and the total value of the proceeds collected is not more than $950. So 50-50 raffle, for those of you who aren't aware of, of exactly what that is, that's where 
the um, participants, the raffle, purchase the uh, tickets for the raffle, and you'll have a pot of a certain amount of money, and they draw a winner, and the pot is then split in half by the winner and the charitable organization. So for example, for an exempt 50-50 raffle, the pot would be no more than $950, and the winner would get $475, and $475 would go to the charitable organization. One other factor with the 50-50 exempt raffle is the tickets can only be sold to members or the guests of that nonprofit. So they cannot be sold to members of the general public. So think about like, say you have a Rotary Club who has a breakfast meeting um, every week and they have a 50-50 raffle. The only people that can buy those raffle tickets are the members of the organizations or guests they might bring to that event. You can't go just sell the tickets out on the street to members of the public. They have to be members or the guests of the organization. So if you're going to have exempt raffles, you should know that you can only have one exempt raffle a week. Um, there is a time, um, a, num a limited number you can do for non-exempt raffles as well, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But if you're going to have exempt raffles, it's once a week. So for non-exempt raffles, there is a significant prize amount increase. So the fair market value of a prize, a single prize that can be offered in a non-exempt raffle is $80,000. And for a single raffle, and you have a group of prizes, those prizes cannot be valued together at more than $300,000. So that's really the key difference between exempt and non-exempt raffles. Um, so you can look at, you know, raffling off cars and boats, um, and this was actually increased very recently. So this was a change in the law and um, last year. Before that, it was a maximum fair mar market value of 40000 So as a nonprofit organization that can conduct raffles, you can have up to four non-exempt raffles a year. Again, this Differ, is differentiated from the exempt raffles where you can have one per week. And something to keep in mind too is you can have both exempt raffles and not exempt raffles. You don't have to choose one or the other. You can do both as long as you stay within the legal requirements for holding those raffles. So if you're a nonprofit that does non-exempt raffles or you do both exempt and non-exempt raffles, you have to file a raffle registration with the Secretary of State's office. If you only do exempt raffles, you, you do not have to register. But if you do any type of non-exempt raffle, you do have to file a registration for each year you hold those raffles. So the raffle registration process is very similar to the registration process for charitable organizations. You have to file a registration form each year that you do raffles and there is a registration fee of $50. And this is a separate registration form than what you would file as a charitable organization under the Solicitation of Charitable Funds Act. This raffle registration form is due the same time as your charity registration form is due, and that's four and a half months after the end of your fiscal year. So if you have a calendar fiscal year from January 1st to December 31st, that due date is going to be May 15th. If you have a fiscal year date of July 1st to June 30th, and that due date is going to be November 15th. And there are separate, there are different types of fiscal years that vary from those two most common fiscal years. The key thing to remember, it's due four and a half months after the end of the fiscal year. So if you're a nonprofit organization that has separate chapters um, and that typically you file one charity registration because you share an EIN, um, you can file a separate raffle registration for each chapter if that organist, if the chapters want to do their own raffles and have up to four non-exempt raffles each year. So the thing to keep in mind though is if the chapters file their own raffle registration, they are responsible as well for filing their own raffle financial report. 
If you register to conduct raffles, you do have to file an annual raffle financial report with our office. Again, this is separate from the annual financial report that you would file for your charity registration. And this is also due at the same time as your raffle registration, four and a half months after the end of the fiscal year. And just something to keep in mind um, for those of you that are charitable organizations that register, you're probably familiar with the fact that with your charity financial report, you can request an extension from our office up to six months. For the raffle financial report, there is no provision for extension. So that is always going to be due four and a half months after the end of the fiscal year at the same time as your raffle registration form. So the raffle financial report has to contain the following information. And this information was actually streamlined last year in amendment to the raffle law. Um, so something to keep in mind um, in terms of your financial records, you do need to maintain um, very detailed financial records for up to three years um, if you're conducting raffles, but the raffle financial report itself has streamlined reporting requirements. So if you file the, right of the financial report for raffle, you're going to have to report the total value of all prizes you've offered. That includes all cash prizes, all donated non-cash prizes, and all purchased non-cash prizes. You have to report the amount of tickets you've sold and the cost of each raffle ticket. The amount of gross receipts, and that's basically all the money you brought in from the sales of the raffle tickets. The amount of adjusted gross receipts, and that's going to be your gross receipts minus the amount you spent on cash prizes and non-cash prizes. You also have to include any the total amount of any expenditures. Um, for example, your raffle registration fee of $50. For example, any raffle tickets you bought, if you had an event specifically for that raffle, you know, any um, party supplies for that event. And then you have to report the amount of your net receipts, and that's going to be your adjusted gross receipts minus your total expenses. And then each raffle financial report has to be assigned and certified by the CEO and CFO of the nonprofit. Again, um, I just mentioned this previously, um, the actual raffle financial report itself has been streamlined, but you still have to keep very detailed financial records for your prize offerings, but who you paid for any um, expenses and how you've spent your net, net receipts from the raffle. And you have to keep these for three years and they're open to inspection by law enforcement and the Secretary of State's office upon request. One of the requirements in the raffle law is that except for 50-50 raffles, you have to spend at least 90% of your net receipts from a raffle on the charity's purpose. So that means that following the deduction of prizes and expenses, 90% of that amount that's left over has to be used for your charitable purpose. And this is important when it comes to raffle advertisements. The raffle law has very specific requirements for raffle advertisements, and that includes that you have to disclose when you're advertising raffle your true name of the organization that's sponsoring the event, what your charitable purpose is, and how you're um, for which the net receipts are going to be used. And also you have to include a statement of the proportion of the gross receipts of all raffles conducted in the previous two years that were not applied to charitable purposes. So in your raffle adver advertisement, you have to include language that basically explains how much you're devoting to your charitable purpose with the gross receipts from the raffles. And just to show you an example, um, this is, this is not actually a legitimate um, raffle advertisement. This is only made up for this presentation. But if you can look at this advertisement, you will see the highlighted sections are those that meet those raffle advertisement disclosure requirements. So as you can see for this raffle, 
Um, the name of the organization would be Palmetto Pet Rescue. And the charitable purpose stated is to um, benefit local spay and neuter, pro neuter programs. So that would satisfy that requirement. And then we included a statement that since 2019, 75% of all raffle receipts have directly supported Palmetto Pet Rescue's charitable programs. So that disclosure state statement would satisfy the um, percentage disclosure requirement under the raffle law. Um, so it's really important when you advertise, you have to have all those factors in your advertisement or you could be subject to a fine under the raffle law. Some other raffle restrictions and requirements just to keep in mind. Um, the purchase price of a raffle ticket may not exceed $300. Um, originally it was $100 and it was recently increased to $300. You can't uh, offer real property as a prize in a raffle. That basically means you can't raffle off a house or a land. And, and this is something we've actually seen um, done before or started to be done and then we sent them a notice and they stopped but um, you cannot raffle off a house. Um, also when um, and this is a, con a question we get a lot is okay how long can you sell raffle, raffle tickets before actually having the drawing and the answer to that is nine months so basically once you've sold one raffle ticket you actually have to have that drawing no later than nine months after the first raffle ticket is sold. And as far as timing for drawings, a raffle drawing for non-exempt raffle cannot be held between the hours of midnight and 10 a.m. So that means if you're gonna have a raffle drawing on New Year's Eve, you have to do it before midnight um, so you don't run afoul of that requirement. Also, you cannot have a raffle drawing on Christmas Day. So if you violate any provision in the raffle law, um, you would be subject to an automatic fine of $500 for each violation. Um, and, and something to keep in mind too, some of you may be familiar with the violation process under the Solicitation Charitable Funds Act where you get a notice of violation and then you have 15 days to cure the violation before the fine is assessed. Under the raffle law, there's actually no right to cure period. It's an automatic fine of $500. Um, and it can be also $500 for each violation and each day you're in violation of the law. So for example, if you're having a raffle and you are not authorized to do raffle, you can be fined $500 for each day from the time you started selling tickets to the time you had the drawing. And as you can see, that can add up a good bit. For raffle financial reports, the fine assesses at the amount of $10 per day, not to exceed $2,000 for each separate violation. So the raffle fine um, price, uh, amount for financial reports is a little bit different. Um, now, it's just something to keep in mind, if you do get a notice of fine from our office, um, you can always reach out to our office to discuss any issues related to that fine. If there was um, you know, any problems with the filings or confusion, I mean, we work with organizations and, um, and we're really happy to do so, especially since the law is rel relatively new. It's only six years old. Um, you can also file an appeal in administrative law court. So, if you have a fine or your registration suspended or revoked, or we deny your right to register as a raffle, you are always entitled to file an appeal with the Ministry of Law Court within 30 days of receipt of the notice. So there is a right of appeal for each fine. So one thing to keep in mind, um, one of the questions we get is whether or not casino nights are legal um, it, and the, the answer to that is is not no not really um, so a casino night is only legal if you have the event for entertainment purposes only and you don't offer any prizes incentives or financial awards whatsoever 
So it would just have to be for fun only and no real betting involved. Um, so in most cases, um, you know, for example, if you have a casino night, you know, an organization might want to say, OK, if you get this many chips at the end of the night, you could turn it in and win this prize. That would be illegal. Um, so at this time, casino nights are still illegal as are any kind of electronic gambling devices, video poker, slot machines or any sports betting. So right now, if it, it's a casino night where prizes are offered, you still cannot have that within the state. So at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Kim Wickersham and she's going to talk about the nonprofit raffle filing process. Thank you, Shannon, and good morning, everyone. I am pleased to be with you today. Um, I am Kim Wickersham, and I will be giving you a tour of our website, specifically the raffle page, as well as completing a raffle financial report with you, and then proceeding to our online filing application, and we will file a raffle registration and give you a tour of the new dashboard from our online system. But this time, let's go ahead and start with the Secretary of State's homepage at www.sos.sc.gov. So the first thing you'll notice on our web page here is the several headings we have underneath the gold bar. To get to the raffle page, let's go ahead and hover over the online filing tab and we will go ahead and pull down to the raffle page here. On this page, you will find um, a section that contains the statutory uh, links to the Raffle Act, as well as the Solicitation of Charitable Funds Act. You'll find both of our annual financial um, report forms for the raffles, as well as the raffle registration form here. And then down below that is the section where you will find all of our um, quick link documents to the non-exempt versus exempt raffles that Shannon has just discussed, the videos um, related to raffles. We will post a, this webinar will be shown on, a link will be on this web page here, as well as some questions and answers that we can go ahead and complete once the webinar has finished. So first thing we're gonna do here is we are going to complete an, affle, an annual raffle financial report form. We are going to have to complete one of these if we register for a raffle during a year. Even if you don't complete the raffle or perform the raffle for whatever reason, you will still have to file a financial report form for the raffle. So let's go ahead and pull that form up by clicking on this link here. And I've actually already got it in a tab, so I'm going to go straight to that tab. And this is what our raffle financial report form looks like. So on this raffle financial report form, you're going to go ahead and provide the demographics for your organization. You'll give the fiscal year for which you are completing the report. Now it's important to know here that you will always be filing your raffle financial report for the fiscal year for which you've just completed. So we have January of 2020 to December of 2020 at the top of the form here. This will be our initial filing. We'll fill in our EIN number. We'll fill in our public raffle ID number here. And we'll put the organization's name. And again, this is the organization's legal name and not the name of the raffle if you have a specific raffle name. You want to go ahead and give your address where we can reach you, your email, and a good phone number. And then you're going to put in your organization's charitable purpose for this one. We are using the Palmetto Pet Rescue is to provide free spay and neuter programs. The very last question on this page um, has to do with how many raffles you had had during the year. So as Shannon mentioned, we don't report the exempt raffles on this form. This form is for reporting the non-exempt raffles and we can have up to four per registration. So if you have more than one register, one financial, I'm sorry, more than one raffle held during the year, you are going to put multiple 
whether it's two, three or four in this line here, and then you'll need to complete page two for each one of those raffle drawings. For our purposes today, we're going to head going to just report one raffle held during the year. We are going to report that this raffle was held on April 15th of 2020. We are going to report that 6,000 raffle tickets were sold and they were sold at a price of $10 per piece. The raffle drawing was not a 50-50 raffle. And then here's where we're going to go ahead and use the features of the autofill form that will pre-calculate your numbers for you as you complete your numbers. And let's go ahead and put in that we had a, a cash prize of $100. We're going to enter that we had no donated prizes. And that we purchased. The Jeep that was being given away in Shannon's uh, pet rescue organization at the price of $20,000. And you'll see that. The form will auto calculate all of your totals for you. Not only does it do that, but it will carry the numbers down to where they're required further in the form. The next question we're going to answer here is the amount of gross receipts. Those gross receipts were again the 600. 6,000 tickets, I'm sorry, at the top of the form at $10 a piece. We have a $60,000. In gross receipts. Again, the form auto calculated for us. And here's where you would put in all of your expenses for the organization to conduct the raffle. So you would at least have your $50 filing fee in here, but if you spent any money on tickets or uh, decorations for the event, whatever is allowed by law to be deducted from the raffle gross receipts, that's the amount you're gonna put here in this form. And we're gonna say that everything was donated for this particular raffle, except the filing fee with the Secretary of State's office. So what we have at the bottom here is we have your adjusted gross receipts, your expenditures, and then your net receipt amounts of $39,850. We're going to use these this information a little bit later when we file a financial report online. So let's go ahead and um, move now to the online raffle registration. We'll go back to our website here. And to begin the process of filing online, we're going to use the icon over here with the link says file online today. You've got some information here that tells you a little bit about our updated application that you can read through and when you're begin ready to begin the process, go ahead and click on the begin the online filing process link. So this will be a first time registration that we're going to do today. So we are going to use the top tab and say register your organization. You can file your charity and PFR information on here as well use on the same page, but for today we're going to go ahead and register a raffle. And as Shannon referenced in her presentation, you have to meet all three qualifications to conduct a raffle and these first set of questions here will um, do that. Just check off these qualifications for you. So you are going to declare here whether or not you have tax exempt status from the IRS. And if you do have one of these tax exempt uh, declaration letters, you can click yes here. If you do not have one of these letters, you would say no. And then the system will ask you if you are a class department or organization of an educational institution. If you are, you can say yes and then proceed on. For our purposes today, we're going to go ahead and say that we are a 501c3 organization and move on to the next question. The next question is confirming whether or not you are basically falling under one of the charitable purposes that Shannon outlined earlier, literary, scientific, charitable education for international or amateur sports, or the prevention of cruelty to children and animal, as well as the religious option. If you qualify there, you select yes and move on. And then the last question here is, are you registered as a charitable organization? So you would say yes if you're registered with us, 
Another organization that might register or answer this question yes is if you were one of those subordinate organizations that Shannon mentioned as well. So let's just for this example say if you have a state sorority um, organization and then you have several chapters, your state sorority organization would be registered as a charitable organization and you fall under their registration if you share the same EIN and they are your fiscal sponsor, you could say yes to this question and then move on and just register your chapter. Therefore, your chapter itself would be allowed to conduct four non-exempt raffles a year. So let's click yes here. So this is confirming that you have uh, passed all the qualifications to conduct a raffle. So let's start with uh, the details. So in this blank here, what we're going to do is we are going to put in our actual organization's legal name. Many people want to put in their raffle name here, but this is actually for your organization's legal name, the one that you use when you incorporated or um, and would also be on your EIN letter. So we're going to go ahead and use Palmetto. Oops. We're going to enter our EIN number here. We have a web address. We will go ahead and enter the web address and then the person registering the raffle goes in the bottom line. It's important to note here that this private ID in this line here, this is your username for logging in anytime you want to enter your dashboard after this registration. It's also referred to as your private ID. You will also be assigned a public ID at the end on your confirmation letter. So make note of this and then you're going to set yourself up a password. We'll go ahead and select an email to be associated with this online registration and then create yourself a password. And then here we go, we'll begin the registration part. This is the new dashboard. And if you'll notice this gold line up here tells you how far you are along in the progress of completing the entire registration. These links down here, you'll be guided through in order. As they get completed, you'll see a check mark next to each one. If at any time, once you've completed one and you're further down, you need to go up and check on something that you completed, you can always click back in there and we'll show you that a little bit further down the road. Okay, our fiscal year end, we're gonna say we're registering for the fiscal year end of 12-31-21. We're going to put in the purpose for the organization is to provide free spay and neuter. Country where you're organize, organized is United States. We're going to say we're organized in South Carolina. We were going to organize, we were established on January 1st of 2020. Our form of organization be a corporation. And here's where you declare which tax exempt status you fall under here. So you say yes to tax exempt, and then you will select the appropriate code section from the IRS for your tax exempt status. In the next section here, you're going to declare whether any officer has been subject to criminal conviction. We will say no. If you say yes here, you'll be required to either upload a document or provide a description in the field below. The next section is for the registered agent. You must provide a registered agent with a physical street address for that reg registered agent. The next screen is the physical address. So for the physical address, you have two options here. Some organizations actually have an office here in South Carolina, and some organizations maybe run um, 
not outside of an office, but maybe they have different people that just work out of their homes. So if you do not have a physical address, you can click on the custody button and here's where you would provide the address for the person who has the financial records for the organization or um, the treasurer. So it's often they're one and the same, but if you don't have a, a treasurer, you might have someone that's just retaining the records for the raffles and you can provide their address here. For our purposes today, we'll go ahead and give our office address. The contact person is the person that is responsible for receiving all communication from our office, whether it's a reminder that your registration is coming due or your financial report is due, or if there is a violation that needs to be mailed out, this is the person that we are required to mail everything to. So this person, you wanna make sure that you give it to be, give it the name of someone who is responsible for receiving and acting upon anything received from our office. And if this person changes through the year, you need to make sure that you log back into your dashboard or send an email to our office and let us know that the contact person is no longer with the organization and that you'd like to update that information. And I'll show you how to do that yourself online later in the presentation. We need to make sure we give a title for this person that's listed as the contact, their address. We need a phone number. And we'll want an email address. The next we're going to provide the president or CEO for the organization. Today we'll put Shannon down as the CEO. We've got her address. Phone number again. Save and next. And then we need the uh, treasurer or CFO for the organization. We'll use Allison Dempsey. We'll put her phone number in here. And save and next. So the next thing we're going to do is we are going to um, provide the category that best describes the organization's solicited contribution purpose. So for this specific one, we're going to say add and we're going to go ahead and choose the animal related category. If you do have several different purposes, you can always save and then add another purpose if you like. If there's one that also um, fits your organization's solicited contribution purpose, but if you don't, you're only required to give one. Does the organization have any offices in South Carolina? This would be in additional to the physical address that you provided back in this link here. If you don't, simply say no. Board members, you must provide your officers and board members to our office for the current fiscal year that you're registering. If you want, you can say that you will not attach a list and then you can simply add each board member name, address, and phone number in that screen, or you can say that yes, you will attach a list, and we'll do that a little bit later on. Do you have any chapters, branches, or affiliates in South Carolina? If you say yes, you'll be provided, be required to provide their um, names and locations. For this purpose, we will say no, that we do not. Do you have any doing business as names. Here is where you would say the name of the raffle. So if you would like to go ahead and you know that you're going to have a raffle that is specific, has a specific name that you're going to advertise it under, you can click to add a DBA and you can call it the 2021 Jeep raffle. Save and next. Here's where you're required to upload your financial reports. And at this point too, I'll go ahead and let you know, this is where I was telling you that if you follow along the screen, you're guided through the process, but if you need to go back at any point and check on anything that you've entered, go ahead and just click back into that screen, review the information. If everything's fine, you just go back to the screen where you just exited and you'll, the 
the program will tell you right here where you're supposed to be at and where you need to pick up at. So we need to upload two documents here, a letter of determination of tax exempt status and the list of officers and board members. Let's go ahead and do that now by clicking upload file. We'll do the letter of tax determination first. I'm going to locate that on your hard drive. Next, we'll do our officers and board member list. And we'll save that screen. And move on to the certification area. So this screen right here tells you who you've listed for the CEO, the CFO, and then the person who is actually completing the registration. Now, if the CEO and CFO are not available to um, confirm the registration or they're not completing it themselves, then the third party um, authorized person will go ahead and click this saying that they are authorized to complete this registration on behalf of the organization. And then you can say save and next. If the CEO and CFO are both jointly filing this or both jointly going to review it, then they should both click off here and then move on to the next screen. For our purposes today, we're just going to go ahead and say that a third party is filing. So what we have here on this last screen for the actual registration portion is the ability to move on and continue to the fees and the payment. But also right here, we have a draft form. So when you pull this draft form up, this is a transcript of everything that we've just completed during the registration process, how we answered our qualification questions, whether or not we have the conviction noted, tells who our um, third party filer is, the registered agent, the officers, and if we have a solicited purpose category picked, you'll find it here. What did we provide the DBA is located here and all of our attachments are here. That is the form that you want to go ahead and save or print for your records. And it will give you a guide for what you told us in the year in case you ever need to look back and change anything. We'll go ahead and move on to the payment portion. So this fee, this page right here, the fees page will give you again. This is your username and your private ID the name that you have registered. The $50 filing fee with our office is listed here and you'll notice that the, there's an extra fee of $1.85. This is a third party um, amount that goes to the company that processes all the credit card payments. So the total you'll, you will be paying is $51.85. All right, so in this part here, we are going to go ahead and complete our credit card information. Name, address, all the typical information you'll need to provide. You'll have to give a phone number and your email address so that you can get your receipt emailed to you. On the next page, you'll give your credit card information. expiration date and security code, the name on the card. When that's done, go ahead and submit your payment. And that is because I used our live database and I apologize for that error, but we have submitted the payment and I'm going to jump over to um, the test database where we actually have this organ organization filed for the rest of this. The financial report, let's go back to that um, for one minute here. When you finish this financial report, you save this to your hard drive. You will need to use that information, as I said, to file the financial report for the organization. Um, you'll want to print it, scan it back in, and have it saved as a PDF. That is the only way that we can accept and upload a document as if, as if it's saved as a PDF. All right, so let's go ahead and log into our registered account. And we're going to use that private ID that we were issued. 
This is one that I have already set up for the purposes today. So this is what your uh, dashboard looks like when you log back in. So as you can see, what you can do from here is you can log back in, as I mentioned, um, if you have a change to the contact person, you can simply click on the contact person's name and you can change this name and the contact information for the contact person at any time during the year should the information change. You can also update the physical address should the organization move. You can provide additional board members or officers. You could upload additional documents if you need to. Let's say your tax exempt letter changed with the IRS and you were reclassified and wanted to send us a new updated letter. You can do that using the upload document link. And you can also add another DBA. If you want to go ahead and say we're going to uh, do another raffle during the year and we're going to call it the Big Sky Raffle and we'll raffle off a trip to Montana. You can add that DBA here and that becomes part of your official record. If the organization has any outstanding violations, you will find them under the violation tab. And this is where once your registration is completed, you would be able to Click on the icon here and pay that fine if needed. If you ever need to change your email or password for the organization during the year, you have an option to do it in that screen here, the change email or password. Let's go ahead and file the financial report for this organization. So we are going to go ahead and file a report for 2021, although we would always typically file a financial report for a prior fiscal year, but for today's purposes, let's say that we know we are only having one raffle during the year and we already had that raffle drawing. So we'll go ahead and file the report. First thing we need to enter is your fiscal year beginning date, which is the same as um, your fiscal year beginning listed above. It's 1-1-2020. One, one, I'm sorry, 2021 for this report. And then your fiscal year ending date is also listed above. We'll enter that here. And then below we're going to go ahead and enter the information off of our financial report, which I have printed out and I'm viewing. And we will go ahead and put that we held this raffle drawing on May 1st. Our prize total value was 20,000. 100 dollars. Our gross receipts amounts were 60,000 dollars. Our adjusted gross receipts. Or 39,900. Our expense total was 50 and our adjust our net receipts amount was 39,850 and save. The next thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to add that financial report. I'm sorry, I clicked on the wrong button. If you wanted to add another financial report, so here's where you would add multiple drawings. So if you had two drawings for this particular year and you had a second set of pages one through three of your raffle financial report, you would add that drawing here and then add all of the same detailed information, but specific to that particular drawing would be entered in the same manner that you entered the first drawing. So let's go ahead and submit this financial report by attaching our financial report. We would just find it on our hard drive. So in this particular example, this would be what your financial report upload screen looks like if you had multiple drawings during the year. 
and then we will submit that report and you can print this for your records. So that is how you register a raffle organization, file your financial reports online, find your violations should you have any with the organization, change your password during the year. If you have no other um, filings to complete with this organization, you would simply log out and it takes you back to the home screen. So that concludes your uh, tour of our online filing application. I hope you find this useful and I am going to turn this back over to Shannon Wiley. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, so we did get a few uh, questions um, that came in uh, during the chat. Um, we do have a few minutes and um, we'll go over a couple of these questions. First of all, we are going to provide a recording of this raffle presentation on our website following the webinar. So you can go back and review it and, and, and forward it to other members of your organization if needed. Um, so one of the questions we got, we actually got this from a couple of folks, is what if you registered to have a raffle, but you um, didn't actually have one, say, during, during COVID or because of the pandemic, you weren't able to have it, would you still need to file a raffle financial report? And the answer to that is yes, but you can report on the, you could record on the report that you actually did not have any raffles, but you still need to submit the report to our office. Another question that we received um, was, do you have to file, do you have to record exempt raffles on the financial report? And the answer to that is no, you would just do your non-exempt raffles, even if you held both exempt and non-exempt raffles uh, during the year. Um, another question we got is, uh, can you have online sales of raffle tickets? And, and the answer to that is yes, you can sell raffle tickets online. And a question, another question we got that's similar um, along those uh, that line is whether or not you can have credit card sales for raffles. Um, can you sell your tickets using a credit card? Assist, uh, uh, using a credit card, um, given that a credit card company would be considered a third-party processor, and that is not prohibited. Um, now, if you had like an exorbitant processing fees or I mean you had a broker and it, it was something other than your typical credit card processing fees we might take a look at that but just credit card sales in and of themselves are not illegal you can use a credit card to you can take credit cards to sell your tickets and then also one last question if you have multiple options to win at a single event does that count as one raffle? And the answer to that is yes, if you're selling um, all the tickets sold go to that one event. So like if you have a drawing for multiple prizes, if you sell all the tickets, you know, would be eligible potentially to win one of those prizes, it would be considered one event. Okay, so one last thing, um, here's our contact information. Um, as I mentioned before, if you have a question, you can always submit it to charities at sos.se.gov. And we also are listing our phone number and our website on this slide. So please feel free to contact us at any time. I would be happy to help. At this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Secretary Hammond. Thank you. I hope you found this uh, webinar informative. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Kim and thank Kim and especially thank our IT staff for putting this presentation together. Uh, I appreciate everything that the nonprofits do for our state, for our communities, for our country, and it's been very trying times. So thank you for all of your hard work. Uh, if you uh, are suspicious of any raffles and uh, want to contact the office to inform us of those raffles, please do so. And you can also uh, notify us through a confidential complaint form. We want everyone to play by the same rules. Thank you so much for watching this presentation and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.